Good morning to all of you who are visiting with us uh, by way of, of our online service, and we're just grateful to God that you are here this morning. I got to thinking about a couple of scriptures, Psalms 133 and verse number one. The psalmist says, how good and, it, and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And then that reminded me of in the New Testament of John chapter 4, verse number 24. that says, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I pray this morning that you will focus your minds to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Let's bow together in the word of God. I mean, let's bow together and go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for all who are viewing this morning. We pray, dear Father, that as we bring our praise to you, that we'll just be reminded of how grateful we need to be, dear Father, for just another day on this side of life. We pray for those who have experienced the death of loved ones. And Father, we're praying for our dear sister, um, Jackie Jeter. And Father, we just pray that you would bless her family. Father, help us now as we get ready to go into this worship experience that we will trust you as we learn to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us throughout our service. In Jesus' name, amen.
I am not skilled to understand. I am not skilled to understand. What God has will, what God has planned. What God has will, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand. I only know at His right hand. Stands one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word and deed. I take Him at His word and deed. Christ died to save me. This I read. Christ died to save me. This I read. And in my heart I find a need. And in my heart I find a need of Him to be my Savior. That He would leave His place on high, on high. and come for sinful men to die. As always, we're very glad to have you part of our online service. Before we get into our lesson today, I'd like for us to pause for prayer. Heavenly Father, please bless us in our study of your word. We pray that you will strengthen us in our faith and in our resolve to honor you, to serve in your kingdom, to be compassionate to each other. Lord, there are a great many needs, and we pray and petition for your care and comfort, for your peace, and for the strength that only you can provide. And so we ask humbly for you to bless us, but all those who are in need all over the world. Uh, may your comfort, may your presence be especially felt by the brokenhearted, by those who are in the midst of conflict and turmoil. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord that you will act as we know that you will, as you've done in the past, out of your sovereign will. We affirm that you are a good and a just, a glorious God, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember that show, uh, Mythbusters? We used to watch it quite a bit. It's where they would uh, scientifically investigate urban legends to evaluate the the likelihood of, of if, if it was true. They would test and see if certain things that sometimes are, are commonly believed, if indeed it's true. And they would actually often 
tackle movie myths and many times the things that we see in the movies, the things that come out of Hollywood, could not actually happen. Well today I want to explore a very common religious myth and it's about the topic of baptism. We often hear it said in religious circles, once you give your life to Christ, you should later be baptized as a sign of your salvation. However, they say, baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. You are saved simply by placing your faith in Jesus Christ and repeating the sinner's prayer. I think uh, that's a myth that needs to be debunked. But before we can get too far into this, let me just first clarify what baptism is so that we understand the term. Baptism is when a person, based upon faith in Christ, decides to submit to being immersed in water, plunged down into water, submerged, submerging them completely, and then coming up out of the water. That is what the Greek term baptizo signifies. A person is buried with Christ in the waters of baptism and raised from the water to walk in newness of life. That's the language of Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Now be sure to note the practice of pouring water upon the candidate's head or, or sprinkling them with water. Those are, those are innovations that arose in post-apostolic times and is not actual baptism. That's not Christian baptism. The kind of baptism we read about in the Bible is full immersion. And there are actually a, a, a couple more things we need to clarify. Uh, two sides of the mythical coin associated with this notion of baptism, if you will. One is that baptism in and of itself saves you. This isn't true. Parents may tell their children, of course you are a Christian. We had you baptized shortly after you were born. And the implication is that infant baptism performed against your will was sufficient to forgive your sins and guarantee you eternal life in heaven. Infant baptism, again, is not something we see modeled for us in the New Testament. But some treat immersion as an adult in much the same way. They will say, of course I'm saved. At age 12, I was baptized by immersion at the end of a sermon. Again, the idea is conveyed that baptism alone makes a person a Christian. This misconception is termed baptismal regeneration in theological circles, as if there were some magical and mystical property to the water itself that grants salvation, as if baptism apart from faith and repentance can act as a standalone event to save someone. This also isn't true. So, let's carefully think about this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible. It, it clearly teaches that salvation is granted to those who choose to place their trust in Jesus' atoning death on the cross and not their own goodness. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We think of other passages that emphasize the importance and the role of faith, how faith is essential for salvation. That very familiar passage that we love so much, John 3.16, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 3 and verse 28, one is justified by faith. Romans 10 and verse 9, believe in your heart and you will be saved. 
Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So, all of these scriptures make it very clear. The first step of obedience is to place our faith in Christ. We are saved in Christ alone. But we need to clarify that this command to believe in the Lord Jesus, to put your faith in Christ, or as it is sometimes expressed, justification by faith. These are summary statements. This is a summary way of saying we need to do all that is involved. It's a summary statement of all that is involved in coming to faith in Christ and does, in fact, include baptism. Baptism is justification by faith. Now, some go too far and allege the very popular misconception that since we are saved by grace through faith, baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Some say, we trust Christ, then sometime later we are immersed in water as a symbol of what happened to us when we were saved. Baptism is just a sign or a symbol of our salvation, like a, like a wedding ring is a symbol that someone is married, but not essential. You can be married and not wear a wedding ring. And also you can be a Christian and not be baptized, some say. But rather than baptism being like the, the wedding ring, it's more like the wedding ceremony. There must be a ceremony of some sort for you to be married, right? The event of the wedding is more than just a symbol of a marital union. It's the actual event that transferred you from being single to being married. Baptism is the believer's wedding ceremony. But baptism is more than an act of obedience. It's more than a symbol or an outward sign of an inward grace. Baptism was originally intended to be a means of receiving Christ's grace. It's a God-given benchmark that testifies to the fact that we are beginning a new life in Christ. And when Jesus healed people, think about this. When Jesus healed people, He often requested an act of obedience as a test of faith. Go show yourself to the priests. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Stretch forth your hand. And when the person obeyed, they were healed. Their efforts didn't heal them. Jesus did. But their step of faith was when they were made whole. In New Testament times, when sinners put their faith in Christ, they were not commanded to repeat the sinner's prayer, raise their hand or sign a card. Those who believed in Jesus were instructed to repent of sin and be baptized. And they responded by doing so as soon as possible. It's not a myth that we're saved by faith in Christ. That's true. We are saved by faith. It's a myth that we receive salvation by just repeating the sinner's prayer. You see, to have faith in Christ means to respond to His invitation to receive the gift of salvation by doing all that we are asked to do in order to come to faith in Christ. We must believe in Jesus. We must repent of sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Each of these things, all of these things, are part of this process of conversion. And to require less than what Christ and His apostles have asked of us is to be untrue to Scripture and untrue to the Christ of Scripture. When we read through the conversion stories in the book of Acts, let's say if, if we were to read through Acts and read those many examples of how people came to faith in Christ, let's suppose we ask two questions. Number one, 
What was required of those who wanted to accept Christ as Savior? That's a good question. Question number two, when did they respond to Him? By being baptized. Here are a few examples. In Acts chapter 2, those who believed that first gospel message that Peter preached, they were told, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. 3,000 people were baptized that very day. Acts 2, 38 through 40. Acts chapter 8, when that treasurer, that official of Ethiopia, believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, he requested that the evangelist Philip baptize him immediately in a pool of water, a pond along the road that he was traveling. Acts 16, the Philippian jailer was told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then he and his family were baptized in the wee hours of that morning. Acts 22, three days after Saul of Tarsus had been humbled by Jesus' appearance to him on the road to Damascus, and Ananias asked him, And now what are you waiting for? Get up, arise, and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on His name. Acts 22 and verse 16. All of these examples, when, and that's just a sampling. There are many more. But all these examples show that baptism was an integral part of what it meant for people to be converted to Christ, to come to faith in Christ. And they did it immediately. I understand some may protest. Are you saying that a person can't be saved without being baptized? What about the thief on the cross? He was saved, and Jesus said nothing to him about being baptized. This is a common objection we hear. What about the thief on the cross argument? Well, well yes, we believe he was saved, but he was still living in the Old Testament dispensation. The blood atonement and bodily resu resurrection of Christ hadn't yet been completed. And, and Jesus, God in the flesh, you know, the prerogative of Jesus, He promised the dying thief He would be in paradise when He requested it. And I think we must admit that this instance of the thief on the cross is a very special case where Christ pledges paradise to this man dying next to Him. And this is, this is not normative for us. The pattern of salvation we have today from Scripture that we should follow necessarily includes baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Some may protest this point further, and I'm quick to point out uh, I'm in sales, not management. In other words, my job is to tell you what God wants you to do as taught in His Word. I didn't come up with this process. God did. But I think we should all desire we should want to. I, I'm not sure why people object or protest against baptism because I think we should desire to humbly submit to God's will. And it is apparent, even from a, a quick reading of the conversion accounts in the New Testament, that there is, as Marshall Keeble used to preach, water in the plan. There is water in the plan. All right, others may say, well, what about a, a dying soldier who makes a deathbed confession? What about a person who is physically unable to be baptized? Won't they be saved if they just put their faith in Christ? Well, again, we certainly hope so. We can only trust God's grace is sufficient in those instances. But the assurance of salvation is promised to those who demonstrate their faith by repenting of sin and being baptized into Christ. Again, that is the model of salvation we have received and must follow. I deeply appreciate the way that Dr. Jack Cottrell expresses it when he points out, Baptism is not the first step a convert takes as a Christian. It is the last step the sinner takes to become a Christian. If you were trained to instruct converts to receive Christ by repeating the sinner's prayer. But let's suppose they refused to repeat the prayer. Would you conclude that they're saved? 
well, you would probably have doubts about the legitimacy of their faith. Jesus promised, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16 and verse 16. So why would someone balk or protest baptism if they're truly ready to humbly submit themselves in obedience to God? You see, God offers the free gift of salvation through the atoning death of His Son on the cross, the beautiful gospel message, the beauty of redemption, that Christ died for us. He took our place. He bore our sin. He did what was needed in order to pay the price and accomplish the task of humanity's redemption. A believer's response, but we have a part. Christ has done His part. We have a part. A believer's response to that great atoning sacrifice of Christ. The, the, the response we should be compelled to make when we look upon the cross is repentance and baptism. And to refuse to obey is evidence of insufficient faith. In the book of James, James wrote that faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works is dead. James 2 and verse 17. Simon Peter taught that just as the flood waters uh, buoyed up Noah's ark, saved his family, likewise, this water uh, baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's in 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse 21. Another way I think is helpful to think about it is this. Baptism is a tomb and a womb. A tomb where by faith we die with Christ. And a womb where we're born again into His kingdom. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And in Galatians chapter 3, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I hope that you will not balk at the command of baptism but that you will put on Christ in the waters of baptism. Baptism is the culminating component to the conversion event. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are ready to commit to Christianity, to leave behind sin and self, repenting of your sin, confess, confessing the name of Christ, then be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins in order to begin that new journey of faith, in order to put on that new life in Christ, and to step forward each day, part of God's family, basking in the brilliance of His grace, having died to sin and self, and been raised from the watery grave, just as Christ was buried. But He gloriously arose from the grave to glory. So also, we die in the waters of baptism to sin and, and death itself, and rise to life and righteousness, up out of the water, renewed and refreshed, made whole and cleansed by the beautiful blood of Jesus Christ. If you wish to study with us more about the gospel, maybe you have other questions about baptism, we would be delighted with the opportunity to sit down with you, to study the Bible with you, to pray with you, to give you spiritual advice, to give you encouragement along your journey of faith. If you are already a Christian, then I encourage you to continue to Step forward each day in humble obedience to the Lord and in compassionate service to those around you. God bless you. Thank you.
we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Oh, Lord.
even when I cannot see you are moving, even when I cannot hear you are singing over me, even when I can't hold on, you won't let me go, you are faithful, you are faithful. Oh,